General was also there. And you know, mm. the High Commissioner of Sri Lanka was fortunately present that, that day when mm. uh, you were there. Mm. So uh, without uh, not taking much time, to, uh, I would like to first of all welcome you on behalf of FPRC. And uh, uh, now I will uh, request you to please go ahead with your uh, lecture. Uh, would you like to use your PPT or etc., or you would like to read? Uh, I don't have a PPT or not to have a written text. Okay, so, you, uh, can just yes, you can just speak. Yes, you can just speak. So please go ahead. Go ahead with your. Uh, thank you lecture. so. Thank you so for those words of introduction and thank you for inviting me. Uh, virtual has made the made, made things a lot lot more interesting and two years of COVID has changed a lot. So like as the event program has said that I would be kind of addressing issues on Sri Lanka and Maldives. And uh, the reason why I'm taking both these topics, apart from my personal academic interest and uh, past works in, in both these countries, is also the fact that at one level in the post-COVID world, both these countries have in, brought in a certain degree of dynamism or, uh, or uh, you can see that a template of the kind of complexity that the world has gone in the past few uh, years and especially after COVID. Now, uh, I hope all of you are kind of pretty much aware as to the kind of internal developments that took place in Sri Lanka about the same time last year. You had the Agaliga protest that resulted in the Rajapaksis stepping down and you've got uh, Ranul Vikramasinghe as president. Now, what many people forget is that this issue was pretty much in the making. The entire political... Uh, crisis in Sri Lanka because this political crisis did not emit from politics but had a more of a economic background to it. And before, and to understand that, one has to understand a two or three issues. One of the first figures was the Easter Sunday bombings of 2019. That had severely affected the Sri Lankan tourism economy. And tourism is one of the four mainstays of the Sri Lankan eco economy, the other two being export of teas uh, and uh, some agriculture portal products like cardamom and uh, then the third item is textiles, basically uh, processed textiles in form of apparels and uh, apparels. And the fourth is remittances from the Sri Lankan diaspora. Uh, with the 2019 bombings in March or April, the Easter Day bombings, the tourism took a pretty bad beating. And by the time that the tourism sector could recover, you had COVID and you had lockdown all across the world. And that had directly impacted the, uh, the exports of tea, tea uh, textiles. And a lot of the Sri Lankan uh, expatriate had to come back or were left jobless and therefore they couldn't send remittances. This had resulted in a significant balance of payment crisis. And that had created the problem. The, and, and if you really want to go back to your history, and this was a ticking time bomb because I say that with a certain degree of confidence because if one goes back in history, Sri Lanka was one of the earliest countries in this part of the world to enter the free trade uh, free trade uh, uh, approach and the capitalistic approach to unbridled capitalistic approach to economics. And this is not, this is even pre-WTO and I talk about the days of the GATT, General uh, Agreement on Trade and Tariffs. And because of GATT and WTO, Sri Lanka ended up importing a lot of commodities, which otherwise it may not have imported. And this I'm talking about like things like uh, milk powder and processed milk, which, which a tropical country like Sri Lanka should have been producing uh, with enough land and fresh water, should be producing it on its own, should have had a domestic uh, production for its do domestic consumption. Along with this is that uh, President Gotabaya Rajapakse, had come up with this idea of you know, to increase public spending, he had drastically uh, slashed on taxes, especially income tax. That had resulted in a significant uh, revenue deficit for the government, which in turn uh, spilled over into the, into the budgetary deficit and, on a, and also into the balance of payment, that is the forex issue. And at the same time, Sri Lanka was also importing significant amount of fertilizers and uh, pesticides. And overnight, without much preparation and homework being done, uh, President Rajapaksi decided, to, uh, Gotabaya Rajapaksi decided to go for organic fertilizers when the country was not prepared. That had also directly resulted in, uh, in uh, 
shortage of food, uh, essential uh, food commodities like cereals and grains, uh, because uh, the farmers couldn't uh, uh, because there was a run on the uh, there was a degree of holding and there was a run on the general agriculture sector because a lot of the traders feared that the that the subsequent harvest could be subs uh, below expectation. And that had resulted in price rise. It was all these that had accumulated into the you no know, the protests which saw which we saw. Now, currently, Sri Lanka is, in, is still in the process of negotiating and trying to go for debt restructuring. They are still not out of the docks, but the ship is no more sinking. The ship is trying to stay afloat, but the question is for how long. And for that, they need to undergo a couple of significant changes, both in the short term. So uh, not only uh, both, but first in the short term, then in the midterm, and then in the long term. Long term first, they may have to seriously start restructuring the economy from these four export commodities, which is uh, tourism, uh, sorry, forex owners, tourism, export of teas, garment, uh, and uh, remittances, uh, and make Sri Lanka into a source of production of goods, manufactured goods, or source of production of services like in India, like you got the IT services, uh, because it, because and and that structure, if they undertake a good number of their problems, can be uh, mitigated. I can't say that they would uh, they won't face trouble, they won't face issues, because if if I can take the liberty of just looking even taking the experience of India, India went through about two critical economic, socio-economic crises in about 25 years. The first was in the late 60s, where for three continuous years or two or three years, we had uh, crop failure because of drought that resulted in a severe food scarcity. And this was in the late 60s. Uh, and I think uh, Dr. Gaur may remember, um, I was not even born at that point of time. I was still decades away from being uh, entering this world uh, was when we were dependent on PL480 grain imports from the US. But what India did at that point of time, we not only did we import grain uh, from the from the United States and got a lot of uh, food food aid from the rest of the world, but we also imported the then prevailing modern agricultural practices, which which uh, set the stage for the Green Revolution. Uh, and this was kind of no. Um, and that resulted within a few short years that India being gradually and steadily becoming independent out of the rest of the world for its basic essential of food. And today, if you see today, what do we really import in the agriculture sector? The only, only commodity that we are really dependent to my knowledge is palm oil. Otherwise, almost all our agriculture producers are domestically made, are domestically made. Yes, we do import a few uh, fruits and exotic variants that is more for bilateral uh, economic ties than for basic essential like things like uh, 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 no apples from Australia that is more for bilateral ties than for uh, necessity and survival. So this change, so 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 we need something like that in Sri Lanka. Second thing was the opening of the economy in the nineties. Uh, Not only really did we send the Indian gold as the surety to get. Uh, much needed forex when after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we also exported our socialist closed door license large economic policy along with the code. And then we opened up. So you need something like that, a structural change in these countries. How are they going to go about it is the big question. <clears throat> and this is required at, a, at an extended long term. In the midterm, it's going to be how are you going to manage your immediate requirement and the transition. And transition in these these uh, in from such a on such issues are not easy because you may have to have a massive structural transition, which means that basically you may have to rewrite the fundamentals of your economic economy, and thereby your political economy, and therefore which may even spill over to your so, uh, social and uh, socio political dynamics of the country. In the midterm, they are trying to negotiate or uh, restructure the debt with the rest of the world. As many you would have, uh, and here we are getting our facts wrong. If you really look at the foreign uh, debt owned by Sri Lanka, the government of Sri Lanka to foreign countries, about 10, 11% is owed to Japan. 
and India is at five percent, and uh, China is about a percent or percent a percent and a half below Japan. So Japan and China are are almost equal, and India is the third place. So about twenty five percent are held by these three countries. Then you got other debts which are from IMF, World Bank, ADB, and bulk of the debt. The debt are commercial borrowings which are held by private institutional investors, and these are largely uh, Western-based uh, commercial entities. So, so I just want to bring that fact because because uh, in uh, this ever since this crisis blew up a year ago, and even now everyone and almost every uh, narrative and comment uh, commentator across the world have made it into a global geopolitical issue of China bashing. But if you really look at the facts and figures, they they produce a they tell a different tale and and issues like economics. End of the day, it is the fine print that matters and not the uh, big loud headlines. And and only if you understand this dynamism, would you able to you, would anyone be able to find solutions? It is not that Sri Lanka has not made mistakes. They have. I'm sorry, guys, for being a bit uh, fidgety because of unexpected rains in Delhi. You have got this, uh, uh, the mosquito, the rain-induced uh, bugs is suddenly sprouting all over my residence, which was not that till last evening, and all this in the past fifteen minutes. So my apologies for my for being fidgety. Uh, so coming back to the issue is that yes, Sri Lanka did make a couple of bad calls, things like that, white elephants like Hamban Tota, Ma uh, Port, Matala Airport, Rajapaksa Stadium, and everything. And that issue, how much of a one may browbeat on that, is what people feel is that for these countries, they much of their orientation or engagement with China was not just uh, the fact that they got mesmerized by this Chinese uh, developmental story, but also comes with a uh, with its own set of riders. The Sri Lankan experience of its ethnic tensions also brought them into the eye of the storm of the Western. Uh, crusaders of of rights and liberty, and after the war, which ended in uh, two thousand nine, till today, you uh, Sri Lanka every uh, six months has to stand in front of the United uh, Nations Human Rights Council and had to kind of defend itself. The only country whom who support the Sri Lankans could really readily rely on were the Chinese, because the Chinese don't pay much attention to to internal domestic matters, whether it be Issues of democracy, liberty, or human rights, and the Chinese vote or the Chinese veto was guaranteed. And this is where you have the issue of international politics or international relations and domestic politics marrying. Second was for uh, for the the former president Mahinda Rajapaksa, who also was the prime minister before he had to step down last year, was that he was addressing a specific domestic constituency. That domestic constituency had a certain degree of expectation or aspirations, who and they were not overtly concerned of the day after tomorrow. They thought that if you construct a port, and uh, uh, would it, it would generate economic activity, which would mean that they would get uh, jobs and employment, and which means that in a short span of time, their fortunes can change. But they they never really looked into the larger economic viability of such. Uh, major or large infrastructure projects, and one of the drawbacks was that an infrastructure project like ports or airports has to cannot be an end in itself. It has to service uh, other industries, whether it be manufacturing or your services, in terms of uh, uh, international travelers or even domestic travelers. And over here, I just take another simple example. Like I'm not sure of the age of the audience, but I'm sure that uh, Professor Gore will remember. Uh, will uh, remember uh, and would have seen seen it first hand, and I remember relatively uh, with some haziness is the kind of development that has taken place across Indian airports and in the Indian aviation sector. Delhi Airport was a small airport which was nothing more than a slightly large bus stop. Today you've got three terminals and flying in and flying out of Delhi is a nightmare because you don't know where you're going to land, uh, which terminal to board. And also the fact that now you see across the country, new airports are build, being built. They are much larger. Why? Because these airports alone do not create economic activity. They serve uh, serve other sectors, whether it be manufacturing or services, but other 
uh, and, and these infrastructures are basically a part of a larger economic structure. One. Now I'll just go another two points on Sri Lanka and then I'll jump into Maldives. On another two issues that domestically, all of us have taken this telescopic vision of, of a country without looking at the internal details. How, how much of a uh, Ranald Vikramasinghe tries or doesn't try to do things? He doesn't have a political party behind, backing him. He doesn't have parliamentary support. He became president because of circumstances. But the president doesn't have the legislature, uh, the legislative body backing him. So if there's if he requires any major changes, he still has to go to the uh, parliament. And the parliament as of today is pretty much under, I won't say control, but uh, uh, majority of the representatives are from uh, two, almost two thirds of the representatives are from Mahindra Rajapaksa's party, uh, SLPP. So when you're going to go from an administrative perspective, how are things going to move? If he's going to undergo any major changes, where is he going to get legislative support? Or even his cabinet. His cabinet is is, is, a, is not a national unity government, but a, but, a, but a cabinet that has got members from all across the political spectrum or, or, or a significant section of the political spectrum. So how long can, will he have the cabinet support? Third, and this is where a lot of our uh, friends from the from different parts of the world make a mistake, is that they equate the current crisis and uh, the with its with Sri Lanka's historical baggage of what happened in uh, May 18, 2009, or what happened till May 18, 2009. So issues of accountability, devolution, trying to address the ethnic issue, and where and this is where a lot of people get wrong is that the Sri Lankan ethnic issue is not a black and white issue of the Sinhala Buddhist Sinhala versus the Northern Tamils. The Tamil community in Sri Lanka. It's quite a generic term because there are three or four different uh, at the at at the macro level, three or four different Tamil communities. One day you got the Sri Lankan Tamils, then you got the Indian Tamils who went in the late 1860s uh, as endangered labor, as the same way that the Indian community had um, been uh, transported or relocated to in places like Singapore, Malaysia, Mauritius. Fiji and the Caribbeans and also Af and also parts of Africa and most of these Indian Tamils are the ones who are in the uh, up country or the or in the hills of Sri Lanka which is the which is the tea country of Sri Lanka. Then you have got other uh, communities which are uh, who, which are identified on religious ground whether they be Muslims or Christians. So so so. So this dynamism has to be factored in. And even within the so-called Sri Lankan Tamils, that is the Tamil which we see, which we associate with the uh, with the 33 decade of ethnic armed conflict, even they are not united. And if one has to just even have to just look at the history of the armed violence, in the 80s, you had half a dozen groups, pretty uh, competent and pretty uh, combative, of which only LTT prevailed and LTT, uh, no, so, uh, took forward the armed conflict for about three decades. But in the post-LTT phase, the internal uh, mainstream politics of the Sri Lankan Tamils is as divided as politics anywhere in the world. So even if you're going to try to solve the problem, what kind of, who, to whom do you talk? Who can deliver on both parties? This is not withstanding the hardliner and the extremist and the conservative elements and the guys who are more liberal and progressive and who would like to engage and try to resolve such kind of differences in an amicable manner. And third is, and along with this is the issue of baggage and attitude. Baggage, both baggage in terms of uh, people reflecting in the past, attitude of a sense of inferiority or a minority complex with both. And third is that they go on maximalistic position without looking at the uh, via media or a functional midway. And over and above this is that a lot of the guys who end up, you know, talking on, on or who are quite uh, vocal end up talking from a political science perspective than from a political administrative perspective. And this difference is that, oh, you, it is good to say absolute liberty. But uh, to give a very simple example, I just uh, read just before the meeting. Uh, a small news blur in my 
uh, phone on my phone is that uh, France is going to start using cell phones to spy on its citizens whom they suspect of being miscreants. Isn't that a violation of private of individual privacy? Sounds good, but from uh, sorry, it, it it does sound horrific that the uh, state can intrude into your personal space, Big Brother watching. But from an operational administrative perspective, perspective, such things have to be done. How do you think terrorist cells are being broken all over the world? How do you think ISIS was ISIS, which had a global reach, and ISIS actually had a global reach, which even Al Qaeda couldn't have, couldn't muster. How was the ISIS dismantled? States have to do a few unpleasant things, but this is the problem. When you're talking about conflict resolution, you should allow the conflict, the parties to evolve their own solution that impose templates and conditionalities. Uh, and with that, I will stop with Sri Lanka. Uh, on Maldives, I'll be a bit brief. On September 9th, Maldives is going to go for election. And in one line, there are more presidential candidates and presidential aspirants and former presidents in that country than voters. It, I am exaggerating a lot, but then if you really look at the country, it's got a population of about 525, 530, or maximum 550,000 people. That is about less than 5.5 lakhs. And the first democratic elections were held in 2008. 2008. Oh, just a second, guys. Gayun, Nasheed, Yamin, Wahid, Soju. And in the past 15 years, the country has seen as, as many as five uh, presidents. And Maldives uh, uh, is an executive presidential scheme form of government like the French or, or like the French. Uh, five presidents, all five of them are alive, including the current incumbent. Uh, in, and this is in a span of 15 years. So you're giving an average presidential tenure of over three years. That is a rough mathematics. And there are a few other political players who aspire to, you know, be president one day. And the only reason why they're not putting their name out in the uh, that uh, hat into the ring is because they have, they have done their homework and that uh, back of the envelope calculation that their prospects are very slim. But that doesn't stop them from having dreams or uh, or uh, hoping to be a, a player in the political spectrum of Maldives. Uh, the current crisis right now is that the incumbent president is a gentleman called Ibrahim Soli, uh, in short, addressed as Soli. His, his best friend, was a gentleman called uh, Mohammed Nasheed, who was the first democratic elected president who, who served in office between 2008 and 2012. And in uh, early 2012, he resigned, uh, which, who, and I will not enter those details because that's a different kettle of fish vis-a-vis -vis the current uh, development in the country. Now, when, uh, and now Nasheed, who, who, played a more than a significant role in making Soli president, was also elected as uh, the speaker. And now between Soli and Nasheed, they have got a, they fell apart. And Nasheed is supporting, is right now in talks with a gentleman called Abdullah Yamin Abdul Gayu, uh, better known as Yamin, who served as president between 2013 to 2018. And he, it was his time that he was seen as being a president whose interests were not aligned with, uh, were not guided by good neighborly ties, but was looking into distant uh, friends who are on the other end of the of the world, and not looking at immediate neighbors as uh, as the as the best conduit for a, uh, for good neighborly relations. So. And uh, Yamin is currently serving a 11-year prison sentence for uh, corruption, which has disqualified him. And as of this minute, uh, except for Soli, there's no clarity as to who are the others who may be contesting the election. Uh, in between, you have also have uh, another old gentleman called uh, Gasim Ibrahim, who from, 20, uh, from 2008 has been active and has pretty much been a kingmaker in Maldivian election. Now, the Maldivian election being a uh, direct presidential election has got a unique system where the election runs where the winning candidate has to secure at least 50% of the popular vote 
So for this, they have a first round of election where n number of candidates can contest. The, <coughs> the top two candidates with the maximum uh, percentage of popular vote. In the event, nobody crosses the 50% uh, bench, uh, ha the halfway point, uh, would have a runoff round. And, with, and between one of them, someone would, would cross the halfway point and the person who crosses it becomes a president. Now, if you take the past three elections, the unique aspect is that the lead candidate in the first round invariably ends up losing the second round because the his competitor or his uh, rival in the second round ends up striking an, an alliance with almost all, uh, all the other uh, political players. And that brings in an electoral arithmetic. The only time which this uh, thing, this arithmetic or this electoral number juggling did not really work was in 2018, where when Yamin lost to Soli and Soli won because even before election, there was an, a united opposition candidate. He came as a, a united opposition candidate. And therefore, this entire arithmetic played out in the, in the very first round of the polling. So, so you know, in the long and short of it is that given the fracture, the fractured nature, where uh, President Soli's party, the Maldivian Democrat Party, which, uh, which at one point of time was President Nasheed's political party, uh, also till till a few weeks ago, is a uh, house with nobody knows as to where is it going because right now it, it has got an internal fissure. But how is this this fissure going to play? Who, who who has got the I won't say the control, but who who is able to prevail over the party and the cadres and the voters? Is it going to be Nasheed? Is it going to be Soli? Is he able to retain the party as it is, or will Nasheed be able to take away a, a chunk of the voters and the party within, or or has he already taken? Second is that the most prominent political player is uh, Abdul uh, Yamin, the former president, who is right now disqualified and in prison, or is serving a prison term. The third candidate is a uh, is uh, Gassim Ibrahim, who is pretty old, uh, and he has got and he has played a role of a kingmaker, of having an average of fifteen percent of of the popular vote, both in parliamentary and in uh, presidential election. And this kind of electoral mathematics is quite uh, intrigu intriguing and interesting. If someone takes a closer look, with this, I would stop and no uh, invite questions or comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sipati, uh, for uh, a very, uh, I, I would say, exhaustive coverage of the developments that are taking place both in Sri Lanka and uh, Maldives. Now I will ask the interns to uh, put questions. Uh, they can ask about the current uh, developments as well as some basic factors uh, affecting uh, India's relations with these uh, two countries, that is Sri Lanka and uh, Maldives. Come mm. on, be quick. Come on, be quick. Introduce yourself and uh, put your question. You can ask questions about the current development as well as uh, some basic questions uh, about uh, India's relationship with these two neighbors. And they are uh, very vital to India's security and all that. Whatever happens there affects India also. Uh, Dr. Shripati, uh, I, I would like to ask for your opinion uh, on a, uh, one of the aspects of India-Sri Lanka relations. That is, uh, how the Tamil Nadu politics impacts India's uh, relations with Sri Lanka. Do they have a sort of veto on India's uh, relations with Sri Lanka? Right, uh, for the, so as you know, I'm from Tamil Nadu. I, I studied all my life in uh, Madras or uh, Chennai now. And well, he work has brought me to Delhi for the past decade or so. So I can tell you with a certain degree of confidence is that this Tamil Nadu factor is being blown way out of proportion. Now, the only time when Tamil Nadu actually had significant role was 
say between the mid 90s from 96 to 2014 when you had a coalition government in delhi and at that point of time they could they could play on this coalition politics and bring about some pressure on the on on india's uh, approach but not significant and let's be blunt that is and 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 if anyone is has seen and sir you would have definitely known better that india's foreign policy is, is decided in south block not in some political party's office or in some uh, pol minister's office on specific issues or one or two issues occasionally yeah and that was reflected in the unhrc vote in 2012 when india did not support sri lanka and went with the western resolution or the uh, west sponsored resolution that was the only time uh yes there are there is a very small section which still is quite sympathetic to the sri lankan cause and and a and a pretty significant section of the population that takes a humanitarian outlook after rajiv gandhi's assassination assassination in 91 the street view is is not as uh, vociferous as as it was in the in the 80s 80s the post 83 riots and the so and the difficulty that the community faced uh, after the uh, black july riots of 83 yes there was a lot of sub sentiments but that was on a humanitarian ground there are still a few people who make a lot a lot of noise but that influence is immaterial is 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 marginal the only time when tamil nadu really played an impact was in the 80s when tamil nadu given proximity became a launch pad and not tamil nadu itself at that point of time it was it was still the government of india that took decisions and a lot of the assistance that we extended to the ethnic tamil groups in organizing them in training them in motivating them which also includes the entire ltt leadership in the 80s after 80s between 83 to 87 88 that was still run by delhi and not by uh, tamil nadu Uh, Dr. Shilpati, there is another related issue uh, mm. uh, regarding India's relations with Sri Lanka. Mm. That is uh, the impact of China on India-Sri Lanka relations. Of course, uh, China impacts uh, India's relations with all its neighbors. But uh, we see in recent years, uh, it has impacted more than anything else uh, India's relations with uh, Sri Lanka. So, uh, how do you look at it? Sir, China impacts relationship with everyone and anyone across the world. So there's nothing unique about what the Chinese are doing in uh, India's neighborhood. But more than going on China bashing, I don't hold a brief. But let's be honest. How do you address it? How many people in the world have, the, have got the money to throw around like the Chinese? How many of them have got the capability to deliver? whether it be infrastructure, whether it be manufacturing goods, or even in global platforms. The Chinese are a UN uh, for, uh, Security Council permanent member with veto. The Chinese can buy votes in any UN platform, uh, whether starting from UNHRC or any other uh, forum. They do have a say in a uh, lot of the global uh, formal institutional mechanism and informal groupings including the G, uh, G, uh, G, G20. So the thing is that when you say China, is that China is not bulldozing its way. It's just making a hay when the sun, sun is shining, shining. And one of the drawbacks is that the West, the traditional West, which was seen as to be the guardian angel of the, of the developing world, of whose largest is even India benefited and continues to ben and, uh, benefit at one point of time is that they are mixing multiple issues and dictating terms on issues that are sensitive for the recipient. Chinese do not make a song and dance about uh, human rights. They don't make a song and dance about democracy or liberty. They only talk to the person in, in uh, power, strike a deal. But they also talk to the opposition and strike a deal. If you really look across the world, however we can criticize, whenever there's been a change in government, there hasn't been a drastic change in policies. They may be tweaking around. This is not like uh, like the Cold War dynamics. One change in um, power and everything changes. 
so one has to understand as to how the chinese have maneuvered that themselves across the world instead of just looking at it as a black or white oh chinese are chinese are robbing the other man of his rightful share we allowed ourselves to be robbed and the and the best example is hambantota hambantota was offered to india thrice twice by mahindra rajapaksa himself did we take it no the chinese came they took it you, the chinese were not the chinese had a different perspective they never really uh, saw it as a commercial project as whether the port would be viable they were looking at a, at, a, at an investment project because they had excess capacity and they needed to keep their capacity engaged their industries alive whereas when we saw it as a commercial project we realized that the port will never will not be viable there were also security constraints or concerns in the in the 2000s uh when the port was offered to us and we never look, uh, looked at it as a strategic venture so these are issues that have to be actually kept in mind is instead of blindly you no know, jumping the gun and 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 uh, coming into conclusions so that's it was but uh, the, don't you think that the sri lanka has realized this mistake on uh, uh, its overweight uh, its over dependence on china so far this port uh, issue is concerned yes so uh, but then they still have the democracy vote all the unhrc hanging on on their head you still have our friends in the west talking about human rights and accountability and accountability when the ethnic war everyone will be everyone in the sri lankan government would have to pay the uh, uh, blood money ranil vikramasinghe has has got a hand in it the rajapaksa is definitely have a hand in it so where is the bug going to stop and the simple question is these countries ask would ask is that why are we being uh, hounded when the west has not been hounded in the past 20 year, two years we know the kind of conflicts that have uh, played is uh, uh, played out in the past 22 years and who is paying the price so it, so it is that simple question and they need a guardian angel if this is the price they pay well it is a case of you know between a hard place and a rock one two is that again when it comes to some specific points china is the factory of the world how many people can supply essential required commodities uh and china is also a pretty large market china is also a, also comes with a very large uh, cash purse they can throw money they may be very uh, tough lenders but they still have the liquidity to lend money how many people have the money to, uh, the money to lend and even if you have seen the news of the last few weeks it is amply clear that uh, essential mineral resources that are required for the uh, in the information age majority of them are in china majority of the electronic gadgets are manufactured in china so that dynamics has to be addressed and one mistake which which we conveniently forget in india is that and we always say that oh in china everything is the party and the party is the country the party is our private companies the west was also like that the west the the uh, private players came first they are, and the country followed east india company came first great britain followed east india company in china the party leads everyone in india we have got a split between the economy and the polity and nobody talks to one another and therefore we lack that coordination when it comes uh, so when it comes to looking the larger picture once we look at the larger picture in its totality and address it in its totality that's when we you can address all these issues including sri lanka's domestic politics which also means that we would have to take considerable effort in addressing uh, that section of the sri lankan polity both within the sinhala south and the tamil north who are, who have got who are quite skeptical about india you are right to to get tested and what about maldives don't you think that uh, maldives is uh, strategically important for india's security and that's why we have to keep our relations in uh, good humor maldives is strategically important like sri lanka for india's security because in both countries what affects them will affect 
will affect India. But what affects India will not necessarily affect, will affect them. Maldives is also strategically important for the global economy because they got the seven degree channel and the nine degree channel, which are two critical sea lanes of communication that crisscrosses the archipelago nation of Maldives. And that is one of the vital uh, shipping lanes in the Indian, in the northern part of the Indian Ocean. Any disruption in Maldives would affect that. And as we saw about 15 years ago, uh, 10, 15 years ago, during the height of the Somali piracy, uh, the entire uh, sea routes on the Western Indian Ocean had to, was drastically, was significantly impacted and, and had to undergo drastic change just to ensure that the, those ships were not uh, you know, hijacked by uh, sea pirates. So, so any disturbance in Maldives will have, and it is for this very reason why uh, China has taken a significant, a significant degree of interest country the Sri Lanka and Maldives, because they need to keep their sea lanes of communication open. The much of the Chinese dream has been driven by its uh, exports. And, and, and all the goods that it, that it exports are largely, and uh, China ends up importing a bulk of its raw material from the rest of the world. So any disruption in that uh, shipping will directly impinge on the Chinese economy. And also the entire Chinese dream that, that uh, Beijing is aspiring to, and, and also Beijing's aspir aspiration to be a global player in the decades to come. Yes, uh, uh, you are right. Uh, now I would like to ask the interns if there are any queries, because uh, Dr. Shivati has already discussed the current uh, development as well as some basic issues concerning India's relations with the two countries. If there are any other queries, please come up and uh, uh, put your question. Uh Good evening, sir. My name is Yashasvi Bhardwaj, uh, and I'm currently a master's student. So my question is very basic in nature. Uh, with uh, How do we see India, Sri Lanka, and India, Maldives relationship in the light of the uh, the, the rising prominence of uh, Indo-Pacific in the foreign policies of the three countries? So how do we see the bilateral relationships uh, of the countries, both India, Sri Lanka, and India, Maldives? Um, I would extend the horizon a bit more, not only with Sri Lanka and Maldives, but also all the neighbors of India. And India's neighbors is just not stops with uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, and Myanmar. South Africa is a neighbor of India. Australia is a neighbor of India. Egypt is a neighbor of India. Indonesia is a neighbor of India. Anywhere, any water body that feeds in or feeds off the Indian Ocean is a maritime neighbor of India. So when you look at the Indo-Pacific strategy, there is a certain degree of confusion because everyone has got their own understanding of the Indo-Pacific region. Mm, it is like the six blind men and the elephant, except for the Russians and Chinese who outrightly reject it. For the Japanese the, and the Americans or even the Australians, Indo-Pacific is more of the Pacific with India in it, not the Indian Ocean. And much of the Indian commentators look at that construct. For us, our primary area of importance is the Indian Ocean. And the waters that spill out of the Indian Ocean, which is the Southeast Asia. You don't have to go beyond the Philippines. The Pacific, yes, the Pacific Ocean is important. But the Pacific Ocean and the island nations of Pacific is a different ball game. So when you look at it, you should just have first clarity as to what, where you're going to operate or where you, which is your focus area. Then comes your focus issues and how are you going to go about it. So this is one. Second is that when you, this is also a, 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 a challenge when it comes to international relations, is that it is like a, you know, you would have to operate with a telescope in one eye and a microscope in another eye. And how are you going to synchronize both these eyeballs is a nightmare. Issues in Sri Lanka and Maldives is a microscopic issue that has to be understood in that context. But the Indo-Pacific comes with a different set of players. So you have got the European countries like Germany, uh, the Dutch, the French, 
and uh, UK coming with their Indo-Pacific positions, position papers. The Russians have outrightly rejected, but let's not forget the Russians still have significant influence in this part of the world. You, you find occasional uh, uh, media reports of Russia's engagement with, with Myanmar in the past 12 to 18 months. How, how is the Russian presence in Myanmar going to impact the greater Indo-Pacific? But as I said, in terms of Maldives and Sri Lanka, what happens in some street in Sri Lanka will have an impact on the whole of Sri Lanka, which will in turn will have an impact on the, on the larger region. So, 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 as I said, how are you going to zoom in and zoom out? I'm sorry, I know I've not answered your question, but this is not a black and white question because this is a philosophical question. Once, once you sort this out, you will know how to play the game. And in this, I would take a, with the, I, would, I don't want like to bore you guys, but then there's another important issue. One of the successes of the United States during the Cold War was that they were dead set against the Soviets. Come what may, Kremlin has to collapse. And everything revolved around that. They had no ties with the Soviets, no economic, political, cultural, people to people, nothing. They only had hostility. And every point of engagement was within that ambit. All Americans who went to Russia, to the Soviet Union, was to study over the Soviet Union, to understand the Soviet Union, so that they will know how to counter the Soviet Union. But who is the largest trading partner of the United States? China. Who is the biggest uh, challenge? China. But what has the West done in the rest of the world? As I given the example of Sri Lanka, the people are dead and gone. You are going to go for accountability issues. More heads will roll. The Chinese, ever since they entered the site, they kept quiet. And and uh, off the record, sir, the Chinese have been funding everyone. If you look at it in Myanmar, because that is one area which I look, which I also look, everyone's weapons comes from China. Whether it be the army, whether it be the ethnic groups, everyone's uh, entire combat, the conflict economy is largely driven by China. The Chinese have got no moral, no uh, compulsions. And they don't impose. Whereas the West, imposes its moral uh, compulsions on the rest of the world and they do what they want on areas which is of convenience for them. So, so, so this issue is also a problem which you can also kind of correlate this issue with respect to my answer on China's role in Sri Lanka. So, I, as I said, I, I, I've not answered your question, but this, this black and white multi-choice question of Indo-Pacific, Sri Lanka, Maldives, India, China. That doesn't really work. I hope I have answered your question. Yes. Uh, Any other question? Yes. Any other question? Yes, so, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yeah, my name is Arogi Moon Kafle. I am currently a global affairs student at Jindal School of International Affairs. So my question is... Which school of International Affairs? Jindal. Jindal School of International Affairs, yes. Okay. Yeah. So my question is, what is the scope of uh, trilateral cooperation between three countries? And uh, there are uh, like... Um, a sub-regional initiative as well, like there are BVIN, but uh, there is not, uh, like Sri Lanka is not part of the BVIN. So what is the scope of uh, one, trilateral cooperation, and second, sub-regional cooperation between three countries? Thank second you. Is? Second is? Second, sub-regional cooperation. Okay, uh, that is a sub-regional cooperation. Uh, our 10 or 20 years ago, you had the India-Sri Lanka, uh, sorry, about 30 years ago, you had the India-Maldives bilateral maritime exercises between the uh, MNDF, the Maldivian National Defense Force, Maldivian National Defense Force and the Indian Coast Guard. And that about in somewhere in 2012 or thereabouts or 13 was elevated to a trilateral uh, annual maritime ex exercises involving Sri Lanka. That laid the foundation 
for the colombo security conclave which which also has uh, mauritius in it definitely i think even she's uh, she species uh this is i'll just take it I was taking the entire. I forgot the members of the security conclave: um, Mauritius, Bangladesh, and Seychelles. Uh, so Bangladesh and Seychelles are where at uh, where the pre-COVID meeting that took place. They were observers, but it is India, uh, Sri Lanka, Maldives, and Mauritius, Bangladesh and Seychelles as observers. You already have a trilateral, bilateral, regional, sub-regional. everything happening but the question over here is that this is these cooperations are are pretty much narrow in their scope the question is that do they have complementary initiatives that encompasses the entire spectrum of international issues which requires political legal economic finance trade investment people to people contact starting from tourism to education and also free movement of people in terms of the labor market so this dynamism has to be factored in there are initiatives being taken and they are uh, no i want to say initiatives that been there they are uh, me me mechanisms that is already set in motion but what next where does this uh, initial uh, like is, is this the end or is it a means to a greater end I hope I have answered your question. Yes, sir. Uh, but uh, but I am I want to ask uh, also about the sovereignal cooperation in particular. Like there are uh, many initiatives uh, that are put forward. Like Bimstek is also there, which is currently uh, active uh, because Sark is uh, not active. So. uh many uh, like uh, all the bimstek countries are assigned with some area of cooperation as well and uh, like what uh, type of role do you see from those countries uh, for enhancing sub regional cooperation and in particular bimstek so oh, bimstek is a, is a much larger canvas because you got thailand and myanmar in it bangladesh nepal bhutan and sri lanka is an island country nepal and bhutan are landlocked himalayan countries how are you going to make these two countries even talk myanmar for the past year and a half is what 14 months 15 months is going to a lot of internal turmoil bangladesh is going to go for election in december january they uh, so another 6 months time bangladesh god really knows what is going to happen to bangladesh after the elections one has to have an understanding of the internal dynamics of bangladesh and when you're talking about this regional sub regional i'm sorry which year you are in first year sir first year first year baga baga yes, yes. i i i was no, i i was with jinder till a year yeah. till a till couple of years ago so i got yeah. off of it right yeah don't oh. act and since given my experience with jindal it is not for the other participants uh arogya right yes 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 don't get carried away by these jargons global regional sub regional transcontinental all these sounds good operationally what is it that you have what is it that i can i have what is it that you bring to the table what is it that i bring to the table the biggest drawback in this part of the world is that all of all of us are competing powers what sri lanka produces this is what india produces india is the largest exporter of tea sri lanka is the largest exporter of tea if you going to have a partnership and all of sri lankan tea into india sorry boss assam brahmaputra will uh, flood assam assam runs on the uh, tea you going to all of sri lankan uh, rubber into india you can forget kerala kerala runs on rubber textiles punjab is going to go off so not punjab gujarat and tamil nadu will go collapse 
they are districts so so this is the issue is that we are looking at such issues uh, at a regional level it is where is the synergy you need complementarity and not competitiveness so that is where european union succeeded asean succeeded because asean had this clear cut divide between the haves and the have nots you have got countries like uh, singapore malaysia thailand and i won't say taiwan but you can also operationally bring in taiwan thailand taiwan given the geographical proximity where these are advanced and developed countries with a higher uh, human uh, development index at per capita income then you had laos cambodia vietnam myanmar and myanmar which had cheap labor one end you had high skilled uh, expensive labor another end you had cheap, uh, low skilled inexpensive labor both of them were complementary that is why the economic model of east asia is still coherent politically they got all kinds of governments brunei is a absolute monarch cambodia is a constitutional cambodia thailand is a constitutional monarch uh, vietnam is a declared communist country uh, indonesia is the world's third largest democratic country why is it that they able to work together despite these uh, divergent political systems is that they have a complementarity a uh, a uh, 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 structure which complements each other where both parties are able to bring in something to the table which is of interest to the other party and they were also able to bury all their past differences when asean expanded in 97 which included uh, by that time vietnam cambodia and myanmar came in the history of the cold war was buried in this part of the world our history is our future 2009 was when the ethnic war in sri lanka gets over why are we still talking about ethnic issues in uh, sri lanka in 20 23 uh, 14 years an entire generation has uh, has been born after the conflict but we are still stuck in time whereas much of southeast asia was able to bury that past much of europe was able to bury that past right or wrong is a different story so it is and start a new chapter so you have to look at things from this context than otherwise again like the previous question i have not answered your question but i am giving you a different perspective and also a different way you can look at things thank you so with that uh, uh, dr jevadi uh, i think uh, you have spoken uh, so could i have a question just uh, it will be too long just wait so now i'm closing the session and uh, uh, i would like to thank uh, dr shripati